in Chicago, two comedian skeptics named Andy and Art were mysteriously abducted by the illusionary mastermind and conspiracy theorist known only as Mr. Mr. Bunker. Bunker. The following serves as a record of Bunker's attempt to convince non-believers of the truth about conspiracies and paranormal activity. Andy and Art give an uninterrupted presentation and verdict on the plausibility of these offbeat topics, delivering what they call the, the whole enchilada. Will Mr. Bunker convince these two skeptics any of this is real? Will it convince you? Welcome to Mr. Bunker's Conspiracy Time Podcast. As always, I'm your co-host, Arthur Stone. And listeners, returning with me as always is your co-host, Andy Hart. The prodigal son returns. Oh boy, look who Who is. Who says you can't go back? (laughs) Bon Jovi. Bon Jovi himself. Andy, you're back in the bunker. I'm back in the bunker. Uh, Round two, ready to take another swing. (laughs) Listeners, you might remember from a few episodes ago, we took a little break there because of the holidays, Thanksgiving holiday. But before that, Andy was not here in the bunker because he was off starting his own prank YouTube channel Mm -hmm. where he farts on people. Right. And obviously, let's see, how did that turn out? It was called Funked. Okay. And uh I was I played the role of the head funk funker. Yeah. The uh, Ashton Kutcher, if you will. Yeah, I was uh 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 Ashton Aston Aston Putcher. Uh and basically the whole idea of the channel is I would uh, some elaborate setup like, you know, uh a rich a uh, dowager goes to a restaurant and as they do there's um a picture of the pope in her soup <laughs> and the waiter gets flagged over and a priest has to come in to exercise a demon from the soup and then i come in as the janitor and i'm mop- mopping soup from the floor and just farting her face when she's watching me mop <laughs> Well, we know it didn't fail because of creative And then reasons. I rip I rip the mustache, <laughs> the fake mustache off, and I go, Funked. <laughs> Funked. Yeah, it definitely didn't fail because of creative reasons, right? No, no. It was, it, uh... No, no. It was creative enough. Uh, it, <laughs> uh, we, you know, we had a good run. Obviously, we got uh, upwards of 12 subscribers to our channel. <laughs> and, you know, I want to thank everybody who made that possible. Uh, but... You know, the, uh, Ecclesiastes are for everything in life. There's a season, and to everything, turn, 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 turn. The birds, uh, they stole that from the Bible. So <laughs> yeah, uh, so art. I mean, you know, you're back. Funked, funked was one of the best times of my life. Oh, and um, you know, I've never felt more creatively fulfilled, and uh, I feel like um. That's the seminal uh, life of my uh, work of my life. That's your magnum opus. That's my magnum opus. Oh, is okay. Okay. Farting uh, on people. All three videos that we did. <laughs> well, Andy, I'm sure the listeners are ecstatic to have you back. Yeah. The listeners probably missed me. Listeners, I missed you too. Yeah. Um, and we got a great topic for you to come back in on oh, here, Andy. Oh, do we ever. Listeners, this is truly our first, like, Big time UFO case. Yeah. We have never truly covered like a full on UFO in the sky. People saw it. What happened kind of case before. We've talked a lot about extraterrestrials and how they relate right. to human beings. And we've talked about uh, evolution and and then and, and alien races themselves. But this is really the first time that we're talking about human beings spotting an object in the sky of unknown origin. And uh, the the one that we chose, that Bunker chose for us to choose, that's how it works. It checks out. Fucked. Fucked. 
like, you got fucked. We got fucked. <laughs> I heard Fred Durst was involved in some of the production as okay, well. Okay, yeah, Fred Durst. I mean, uh, we did we did one episode uh, where did it all for the fucky. Yeah, we were getting dursty, uh, and it was all it was all about getting a glass of water and just farting in someone's face. Okay, you know, somebody's so you know you got one of those old fashioned like igloo syndrilical coolers with the little spigot on the bottom. Yeah, yeah. Somebody bends over at the buffet line to get a little bit of water, and then Fred Durst just pops in and farts in their face, and he goes, funked. <laughs> great. Great show. Uh, and then, you know, you know, I set it up. I'm standing there by the buffet before Fred Durst comes in. I'm like, oh, you getting a little water? You must be getting dirsty, huh? <laughs> and they say, what? And that's Fred's cue to pop in and just rip a big old fart straight in their face and then go funked. Funked. <laughs> well, listeners, you're not being funked today because we're covering the Tehran UFO encounter of 1976. Uh, this is a great one. <laughs> a lot of really, like, this is a crazy one because it was investigated by two different governments. Mm -hmm. It has plenty of credible eyewitnesses and yeah. uh, it's bizarre. It's bizarre. It's a weird one. Um, listeners, if you want to skip right ahead to all that UFO action, as always, just look in the show notes, baby. You're not going to get funked. No. You're going to find a timestamp right there. You can skip right ahead to the research because first, Andy and I, well, we got to, we got to, we got to chit chat a little bit. It's been a little while. And listeners, I promise you, if you go to the mark set by the timestamp, when you get there, it won't be me farting into the microphone. That will never happen. Funked. Um, so go ahead, check the timestamp in the show notes, go straight to the research. But first, as always, every week, Mr. Bunker captures Andy and I in a new and peculiar way. Who and we're we? gonna tell you about it. Yeah. Andy, I mean, this is your big your big day back, so I'm assuming that Bunker went all out. Um, you know, Mr. Bunker and I have had a mixed relationship over the year, and I think that um this is uh this is really one of his more, I don't know, difficult to swallow uh, abductions. Gave you a horse pill. When, no, no, I suppository. Mean, not literally. No, I mean, okay. it's uh, figure speech. Oh, okay. Um, but uh, Art, uh, um, you you know this. The listeners, they don't know this. Yeah, uh, but, but I know this because I know you. But you know this because you know me. I'm well known for my luscious locks. Andy has a good head of hair. Yeah, it's pretty thick. It's I mean, it's very simple. It's not right. stylish in any way, but uh, you know, he, 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 you know, he. Okay. I mean, it's not. It's just a simple comb over. Uh, yeah, it's a comb over. Yeah. You're not doing a. You, you don't come out like, oh, hey, I'm crazy Andy with my crazy mohawk. But it looks good. Right. You have a good head of hair. You're very proud of it. And it. You're right. It comes in thick. It grows very fast. So, I mean, a regular haircut. Uh, is a necessity for for a person with my uh, with my hair. That's right. So um, I've been getting my hair cut at a local place called Sam Poo's Hair Emporium, um, and cute. Frankly, I've never had a bad experience there. Um, the my I went um, today to get a haircut, and my regular stylist Ernie was out. So. I just I just get to see the walk in stylist. You know they have somebody there oh, to pick walk ins. And you don't want to do that. Uh, you know I like I like to do my normal, but if not, <clears throat> it's fine. Most I mean everybody there is nice and stuff. Sure. So Sam Poo's hair emporium. Yeah, Sam Poo's hair emporium. When I go to get a haircut art, I like to get shampooed too. Um, all the way down like a dog. Yeah, like I strip naked and uh, they put you up on a big table. They just let me stand in that sink and. Uh, or, you know, I can put my, I can crouch down and put my buttocks in that space that's supposed to be for your neck. And then they just shampoo me all the way. Um, because I got a lot of body hair, too. You're a hairy it's, guy. It's thick and uh, it comes, grows fast, too. Of course. Yeah, it's very sandpapery. Um, so I get a full body shampoo when I go to the salon. You don't just have a grating personality. You have a grating body hair as well. Yeah, a grating <laughs> body appearance, too. Uh, okay. It's not, not nice to look at. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, I snuggle, I get snuggled into this, uh, you know, they're starting with my head. I snuggle into the guillotine oh. sink, uh, and the stylist starts, you know, washing my hair. Oh, yeah. Uh, 
Uh, and after just barely starting to rinse uh, the shampoo out, uh, the stylist leaves me alone mm-hmm. and goes to answer the the shop phone. Oh yeah, um, you know the phone rings. Oh, everybody, they don't emporium. have yeah, they don't have like a receptionist. It's oh, they're all busy. Stylus, so yeah. so the stylist has to go answer the phone. It's fine. Uh, I've got you know <clears throat> the shampoo in my hair, so I have my eyes closed. I'm kind of oblivious to what's going on sure. a little bit because my eyes are closed. Um, another stylist uh, comes by and says. Um, they notice that I need rinsed, um, and I say, oh, wow, thank you. Rinse me. Oh, please, rinse me. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> before I know it, though, I mean, I'm, a, I'm like, oh, this is great. How nice. Yeah. Before I know it, though, I'm being waterboarded. Uh, <laughs> oh, my God. Like the sink is full of water, and the stylist keeps dunking me under again and again and again, just dunking my head in this water full of sink. Jesus. A sink full of water. I'm getting like repeatedly sprayed in the face by harsh jets of water. You oh know, my from God. that thing that they rinse you with. Yeah, like a soda stream that they see in a bar. Right. Yeah, from, like a soda gun. Uh, finally, finally, after minutes of this, the water torture abates sufficiently so that I can catch my breath and. I can see clearly now. The rain is gone. I was being waterboarded by, 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 by Mr. Bunker all day. Oh, my God. That's right. So by this point, the shop is, like, completely empty. Naturally. It's just me and Mr. Bunker. So I see my opportunity. I run for the salon door oh, as fast as I can. You still have the cape thing The on. cape thing, yeah. I look like oh a God. wet superhero. <laughs> uh, as I run, Bunker whips out a cowboy hat. Uh, he, he and pulls out a lasso made of human hair. Uh. Um, he mounts uh one of those salon chairs, you know, <laughs> yeah. like a horse, and he pumps the foot pedal, uh, to undulate the chair toward me. It's just like creeping along the floor <laughs> at me. Uh, I get winded after about ten seconds of running, and I fall down in the shop. Um, and as I'm struggling to my feet, it's hard to get up from the floor. Uh, Mister Bunker, uh. Snares me with the lasso. Oh, he, my God. He hog ties me. Oh, my God. And pumps the chair all the way to the bunker with me in tow. <laughs> so here I am. I still need a haircut. I'm very wet. <laughs> Help. Wow. I guess you learned your lesson. <sighs> don't, take a, don't take a week off. Jeez. Don't try and start a YouTube prank channel. <laughs> I think that he and was ditch. offended that I had another project. I think so, Andy. You haven't finished your your contract with Bunker, whatever that is. Uh, we never signed anything, his, but his the contract is unknown to anybody but him. And oh my god, you know I don't play by anybody's rules but my own. That's the one thing about me, Art. If there's one thing I can say about Andy, is he he definitely plays by his own rules and Thank goes you. to the beat of his own drum. Yeah, but unfortunately, Andy, for you, I think Bunker's drum is a little bit louder. His drum is loud. You're but... playing like a little t- baby like bongo, and he's got a big ass bass drum. Well, I don't think that size matters, Art. <laughs> it's about how you bang the drum. Hey, say that to our wives, am I right? <laughs> you don't have a wife. I don't. Uh, it's not the size of the drum. It's how you bang it. <laughs> you like to fuck drums. I fucked plenty of drums. You're not allowed in Guitar Center anymore. No, I like that feel of that sheepskin. <laughs> Real nice and taut. Ooh. Ding, ding, ding. Well, and your penis is also shaped like a drumstick. That's true. Yeah, it's very <laughs> narrow, but with a very bulbous tip. Wow. Well, Andy, uh, it's good to have you back. I mean, it, it's nice to get back into the swing of things. You and I Obviously, march to the beat of a different drum. <laughs> Beautiful. <clears throat> um. You know, I, I I definitely I didn't want to see Funked fail, but I can't say that I'm not glad that it did. I, uh, it failed. I mean, I don't know. I thought I it was fail. a success. I mean, I don't know. This is kind of a hot take from you. Farted on a lot of people, and even worse, you brought in Fred Durst. Yeah, that dowager got what was coming to her. <laughs> Well, Andy, as you are, as am I, I am here, and we are here together. 
That made sense. Andy, I am he. Go ahead. Would you like to know how I got captured? I do. I want to know. Andy, as you know, across major cities and metropolitan areas across the country, there are these electric scooters. Yeah. You heard about these? You seen about these? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, uh... All sorts of weird little scooters. And people are making jokes about them. People are memeing them up. Now, folks, these are like Razor-type scooters yes. with, that are that are electrified motors. Mm-hmm. Uh, not, not like a... Not like the kind of scooter with the shopping cart that you ride around the grocery store if you're, uh, <laughs> you know, an invalid. Or uh, or just a straight up like mongoose razor scooter that you had as a kid. These are electric scooters that you, uh, you can get them on like any street corner in most major cities. Mm-hmm. And you kind of like you scan something with an app. Right. And mm-hmm. then you pay like I think per mile or every 10 minutes or whatever the pricing is yeah it's like a divi or a city bike but it's a scooter and then you just leave it yeah you just leave it wherever yeah just throw it in the trash you can literally just fucking throw it in the trash leave it in the street that's kind of the big joke about them is is people are just, just taking them everywhere and leaving them wherever because yeah. they don't need to they just the company comes and picks them up and i don't know i guess resets them or something mm. yeah regardless i decided to take one of these andy and i listen i know what you're gonna say I should have looked at it. The brand was Bunk Tech Scooters. <laughs> yeah. I thought, well, I see where this is going okay, already. All right, Andy. All right, Andy. Listen. Come Mr. On. Goes Off and Starts a Fart YouTube Prank Show. Bunked. <laughs> I got bunked. They, they're they called the Bunk Tech Scooters. Yeah. A lot of these, you know, there's all sorts of weird brands. I thought, like, like they, I just thought they were like any other electric scooter in the city. Bunk Tech I should have I should have looked at the brand name first. So. And I feel like you've had run-ins with Bunk Tech before. Didn't Bunk Tech make that like a water balloon cannon or uh, something? Bunk Tech made the water balloon cannon. He made a vape the called vape Bunk pen, Tech. Yeah. Uh, so apparently this is Bunker's line of various electronic devices. It's a good commitment to the brand. I yeah. mean, this is good uh, consistency. Yeah, good commitment to the brand. <laughs> good commitment to the brand. Bunked. The thing about these Bunk Tech scooters that I learned is that they only go 50 miles an hour. There's no zero. There's no zero. No five. They immediately are going 50 miles an hour. You can't slow down. There's no brake either. (laughs) The only way you can stop the scooter is you have to do a sick bunny hop in front of some seventh graders. Wait, and then it'll stop? They have to be in front of some rad seventh graders, and it will stop. It's the only way you can stop the scooter. It senses how rad the seventh graders are? It senses how rad they are. It has to know that they're seventh graders. It's the only way. You can only go 50 miles an hour or stop. That's it on these Bunk Tech scooters. So, and the only way to make it stop is to do the sick bunny hop in front of some rad seventh graders. Right. At 50 miles an hour. There's no braking. There's no yeah. slowing down. You could just jump off of it. You could. But, you know. Just roll. Duck and roll. roll. But So there I am. I'm speeding down Milwaukee Avenue. Yeah. I'm trying to stop Andy because I realize my mistake immediately. I need to get off this fucking thing. So I try to stop. I try to do a cool bunny hop. Uh, but unfortunately, it was not a pack of seventh graders. They were actually high school juniors. Also, I didn't land the bunny hop. Oh, you didn't do anything right. So I crashed going 50 miles an hour into the window of a CBD storefront. Yeah, right. And, uh, you know, through the glass, Mm -hmm. glass is shattering everywhere. It sounds like Stone Cold Steve Austin's intro music. Um, (laughs) It was just, it was a whole mess. The the, the high school juniors are pointing at me. They're laughing at me. They're taking pictures of my ass, making memes. Goddamn. (laughs) This had to be such a flashback for you. I know. I'm getting roasted. Yeah. Getting roasted by these kids. So I'm crashing through the glass. There I am, glass everywhere. Who was in the shop? Did you get glass embedded in your body and Probably skin? in some ways. Oh, in some ways? <laughs> Both physically and figuratively. <laughs> yeah, figuratively, yeah. I mean, the shards of glass through ma- making fun of me. <laughs> wow, this has turned so poetic. <laughs> Who was there buying CBD gummies? Mr. Bunker. <laughs> CBD gummies? Yeah, he loves CBD gummies. <laughs> oh, geez. So, I mean, he just casually, like, Picks me up and just puts me in his van. Well, yeah, he was in those gummies. He was probably feeling good. Puts me in his shopping bag full of his CBD gummies. (laughs) This was a big bag of gummies. I mean, he's getting a big bag. (laughs) Wow, he likes them. Oh, baby, he (laughs) likes the gummies. CBD gummies. (laughs) Who's this guy? I don't know. (laughs) But he gets excited about CBD gummies. (laughs) I don't know who he is, but I like him. Sounds like Wheezy McGee or something. <laughs> ah! Oh, he's got gummies. This is Gumby. 
Oh, Gumby! <laughs> the anthropomorphic Gummy. <laughs> Uh, also, I think the scooter app gave my phone a virus because there's all these <laughs> hentai pictures saved in my photos. Oh, yeah. That are definitely that was, not mine. Yeah. They're not mine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. The, 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 the app gave you a virus. <laughs> you got funked. <laughs> you got funked, dude. That's our hentai. I got uh, hentai. I got honked? Yeah, you got honked. Hentai punked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well... You know what, Andy? This was really a this was really an abduction for the decade. Yeah, uh, return to form by Bunker. Yeah, really. He got us both pretty darn good. He got us good. He roasted our asses, man. I mean, he he lassoed me with a with a lasso made of human hair, and he got you to crash at fifty miles an hour through the window of a CBD store. Yeah. At least I didn't have to pay for the damages. You didn't? No, I got away scot free. Oh, the uh, scooter company has to pay for it. I'm. Bunk I think Bunker just probably left it. Oh, you know, he's probably. got he's got no ID. He doesn't have a social security number. That's true. No one's gonna find him. Yeah, he definitely only pays in cash. <laughs> yeah, huge bag of gummies. <laughs> oh, it's a big bag of gummies. What a big bag! He's got, he's got, he's got, You're like in Harry it. Carey mixed with some like like John Candy. Like I can't put my finger on it. Uh, it was giving me like, uh, and I don't want to say this, but it was giving me like a Bill Cosby feeling. <laughs> a little bit. Not good. Pudding probably. pops. Except these into CBD gummies. CBD gummies. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, Bill Cosby is disgraced at this point, so yeah. I don't know. He's uh, blinded in jail. Oof. <laughs> anyway, uh, listeners, you're going to be blinded by the light pretty soon. Blinded by the light. That's right. Uh, Rubbed up. Like a deuce, another runner in the night. Rubbed up like a douche. <laughs> Rubbed up like a douche. Um, because the, the the UFO that we're describing today, the the, the Tehran UFO of 1976, was incredibly bright and weird, and uh, it's got just like me, incredibly <laughs> bright and weird. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's not waste any more time here, listeners. Let's get right into our little jet plane, and let's. Playoff. Excuse me, I burped up my burrito. <laughs> We're leaving on a jet plane. We're going to Tehran again. Wow. Beautiful, Andy. Um, we're leaving on a jet plane. We're going to Tehran. We're taking you with us, listeners. So let's all do the Tehran twist and get into it. This is the Tehran UFO of 1976. <laughs> Listeners, the topic we are about to discuss today, the Tehran UFO incident of 1976, is considered by many UFOologists and stargazers alike to be one of the most bizarre and convincing UFO encounters to date. There was an intensive investigation from two countries' governments, multiple eyewitness accounts, and even a jet plane dogfight up in the sky with this UFO craft. Now, we here at Mr. Bunker's Conspiracy Time Podcast, a family company, <laughs> don't mean to leave you in suspense. But in order to give you the whole enchilada on this topic, we need to understand the historical context and political situation of the time. Therefore, listeners, that requires a brief history lesson. Oh, boy. Yes, and a certain co-host of the show has been a very good boy lately. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. So, Andy, please go ahead and pick out a history lesson, one history lesson, to help the listeners understand the political landscape of the time. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Thank you, Art. Thank you ever so much. God bless us, everyone. Just kidding, everybody. Your God is dead. There is only I, Andy, God of history, king of chronology, master of mundane meandering. 
Oh, no. <laughs> what have I done? <clears throat> <clears throat> anyway, Art, I'd like to do a brief overview of the relations between the USA and Iran at the time of 1976. Now, it might come as a surprise to some of our listeners, but for a few decades, the U.S. and Iran were strong political allies. And the fact that they were such strong allies does indeed add to the UFO encounter we shall describe today. Iran in the mid to late 1970s, before their revolution, was ruled by a monarch backed and aided by the U.S. government. His name was Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, but commonly and henceforth referred to as the Shah. Now, the Shah was put in power as the leader of Iran in 1953. The CIA and British MI6 staged a coup of the former Iranian leader, Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh, in 1953. Mossadegh was, a, was an Iranian nationalist, you see, and he felt that the oil Iran produced should be owned by Iran and not sold to the Anglo-Iranian oil company, a.k.a. BP, as it is known today. Mossadegh actually succeeded in kicking out the company and nationalizing Iran's oil production for a brief time before the CIA and MI6 successfully staged a coup to overthrow him. Thus, the Shah was put into power. The Shah put into practice many laws that westernized Iran, stripping the country of Islamic religious measure in their constitution. He also forcefully industrialized the country. Now, there's not anything inherently wrong with these acts, but... 1970s Iran wasn't all doing the Tehran twist and groovy, if you catch my drift. Oh, they do. <laughs> you get it. The Shah did commit a lot of human rights violations, <laughs> uh, in all fairness. He would quickly silence political opponents, even using Iran's version of the CIA, the Savak, to do so. He allowed the sale of Iran's oil to line his own family's pockets and the pockets of foreign leaders, which increased the already lengthy wage gap among the poor and elite of Iranian society, causing civil unrest. His radical industrialization caused many poor, unskilled workers to move from the countryside into the cities. These migrants tended to be more religiously and socially conservative, causing civil unrest. And finally, some poor economic choices left shortages, bottlenecks, and inflation causing civil unrest. Hey, I'm seeing a pattern here. Oh. <laughs> you can't get one past me, Art. <laughs> the U.S. and the U.K. didn't care about all this, though. They continued to back the Shah because Iran was strategically located next to the Soviet Union, and they feared the spread of communism. So they needed Iran as a powerful ally in the Middle East. Also, that sweet, sweet oil money they were getting. Oh, baby. baby, that tastes so good before you go right to bed. <laughs> However, the communists and conservative Muslims in the country hated the Shah and considered him a puppet of the Western countries, which eventually led to the revolution which would unseat him and replace Islamic religious law in Iran until this very day. But that's a story for another time. What a great bedtime story that is. You'll love that one. That'll put you right to sleep with sweet dreams. <laughs> now, this was a, uh, a brief overview of a very complicated history. So let's backtrack here to 1976, three years before the aforementioned Iranian Revolution. Sure, there's civil unrest and the economy is shaky. But remember, the U.S. and Iran are allies in this story. We have a westernized Iran as well. Very well done, Andy, and I hope you enjoyed giving that history lesson. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm fucking spent, bro. These nards are drained. Wow. Anyway, let's get to UFOs. Drain my nards. No. Tell them that story. <laughs> no Woo. more nards. <laughs> Woo. Gonna have to get a nard refill from UDF. Woo. UDF. United Dairy Farmers. <laughs> Filling our United nerds. Dairy Fuckers. What up? <laughs> Fill these nards. All right. Okay. Let's get to UFOs here. Listeners, we're going to give a detailed account of this UFO encounter. So, here's the first instance with this object. On September 18th, 1976, at around 10.30 p.m. in Medabad uh, Airport in Tehran, they receive a phone call from a civilian in the area describing bizarre activity in the sky. Hussein Peruzzi was the night supervisor in charge of the air traffic control tower, and he had over 13 years of experience working in the field. He listened as the woman described, quote, a strange object in the, in the, like a sun in the sky, 
around 1,000 meters or 3,000 feet above her. The colors changed through red, uh, orange, and yellow. She also said it was shaped like a four-bladed fan or, for you youngsters out there, a fidget spinner. Millennial. (laughs) And it glowed red, yellow, and orange. The object could also split apart in two and then rejoin as one. The woman wanted to know, well, just what the heck it was. Percy told her not to worry and he would check up on it. But he didn't check up on it. (laughs) You see, the radar... Ah, my classic tactic. (laughs) Classic tactic. The radar at the control tower where he worked was being repaired at the time. So there was was nothing really to see. Percy assumed the woman probably just, you know, saw a star or something, and he went back to his air traffic control duties and forgot about it. But over the course of a half hour, Percy received three more phone calls from civilians describing similar objects seen in the sky all around the same area. This was finally enough to pique his interest. Around 11.15 p.m., Peruzzi goes out onto the terrace of his air traffic control tower with his Knox, his Binox, his binoculars. (laughs) Oh, okay. I like to abbreviate binoculars. Yeah. To try and locate this strange object. Binox. Binox. He calibrated his Binox until he could read the writing on a distant aircraft and then directed them northeast. It took a minute or so, but then... He saw it. Peruzzi sees a strange cylindrical shaped object with blue on the right and left ends and a red light glowing in a circular pattern around the middle. But the light wasn't a continuous circular pattern, however. It would pause every 90 degrees. The entire object also oscillated slash tilted back and forth like a seesaw as it slowly traveled northward. Suddenly, the object disappears for a few seconds and then reappears at a further northward location. But the object had changed shape. According to Peruzzi, and I'm quoting here, I could could see it this time as bright as a sun. It was all yellow, like a star, but much bigger. Then it appeared to me to be like a starfish. I can't be sure of the order of the colors, but there were blue, orange, red, and yellow lights. End quote. So it had changed from a syndrilical object to a weird droopy starfish or a fan-like shape with drooping blades. These blades were dark orange at the hub, but blended into yellow at the tips. The hub of the fan shape was a large green circular shape with a core that glowed like a piece of hot red coal. Peruzzi gave the the binox to some of his trainees who were also working at the tower that night. They, too, saw a bizarre object in the sky, but they saw it as a half circle with similar colors. Over the next several minutes, Peruzzi watched as the object changed from the first cylindrical shape into the droopy fan shape. Peruzzi knew the object was weird, but he didn't do anything about it. He had air traffic control duties to attend to. So, much like Art and his ancestry, he forgot about it, and he (laughs) went back to work. There were no aircraft scheduled to land at this time, but during the next hour, four aircraft flew through his control area and reported something odd. They reported receiving an emergency distress beacon in the area at 121.12 megahertz. One of the pilots of a civilian airliner asked Peruzzi's tower if there were any downed aircraft in the vicinity. There were not, he replied. The strange distress beacons, combined with the strange objects he saw earlier, finally compelled Peruzzi to call this in. So he radioed the Imperial Iranian Air Force at 12.30 a.m. Peruzzi calls the Iranian Imperial Air Force, or IIAF, and tells the officer on duty everything. That officer then in turn calls General Yousefi. Peruzzi then again (laughs) has to explain everything to General Yousefi. The general then calls two radar stations at Babulsar and Sharuki to see if anything comes up on their radar systems. Nothing does. So, the general goes to his rooftop terrace. A lot of rooftop terrace in this story. Yeah, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of, a lot of nice terraces, I mean. Yeah. To take a look. Then, he sees it. The same object that Peruzzi described. The general is convinced this is not a star in the sky. So, he calls that shit in. General Yusef... Oh boy, easy for me to say. General Yusefi called Shiruki Air Force Base, about 300 kilometers from Tehran, and orders an immediate launch of a Phantom F-4D fighter jet to go do recon on the object. 
Iran had purchased over 30 F-40 Phantom jets, the same ones used by the U.S. during Vietnam, and were still in use by the U.S. at this time. Remember, they were allies. They were allies. Um, <laughs> and maybe these are the jets that are still in use in Iran's Air Force today. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Captain Mohammad Azakani responds to the scramble order at 1.30 a.m., and not soon after taking off, he spots the UFO. It wasn't hard to miss since it was bright enough to be seen from 70 miles away. So Aziz Khani proceeds to a point about 40 miles north of Tehran. General Yusefi orders Aziz Khani to get as close as possible to determine the shape of the object, but to do nothing else. That is, just scope it out and don't attack it, or in my case, try to eat it, <laughs> which is always what I do when I find something I don't understand. I just eat it and see what happens. <laughs> Aziz Khani does so, and the object now appears to be around 12,000 feet high in the air. He reports that as he approaches, traveling at half the speed of sound, the object seemed to speed up to stay ahead of him. He described it as, quote, half the size of the moon as seen from Earth, and it was radiating violet, orange, and white light about three times as strong as moonlight. Now, Art, just what the heck is this thing? Andy, I don't know. Well, but if what I do know, Andy, is that if Top Gun tells us anything, it's that nicknames are hella cool uh -huh. and that pilots like to go fast, baby. Woo! Aziz Khani speeds up to catch this damn thing, hitting Mach 2. <laughs> that is 1,500 miles per hour or 25 miles per minute. That's flying, baby. That's flying, baby. But he still couldn't catch this thing. At this point, Aziz Khani was approaching the Afghanistan border, which is about 500 miles east of Tehran. So Yusefi ordered him to abandon the chase and return home. Aziz Khani obeys the order, but as he turns to head back, so does the object. The strange object begins to chase, chase Aziz Khani <laughs> and surpasses him back to the city. When Aziz Khani was about 150 miles from Tehran, the object reappeared over the city. As he approached the object again, this time getting within 29 miles of it, he lost all control of communication and navigation instruments. Peruzzi even reported later that suddenly, as the pilot was talking to him on his radio, it went dead as he approached the object. Aziz Khani naturally, you know, freaked out, notices he is low on fuel and decides to abandon the chase completely and just head back to Shuruki. Once, once he stops heading towards the object, he suddenly regains all his communication and navigation uh, capabilities. Before he leaves the area, however, he reported receiving the same emergency beacon that's just, that the civilian pilots intercepted. Now, mind you, this entire encounter only spanned 10 minutes. And it's about to get even weirder. At 1.40 a.m., General Yusefi orders a second scramble of a fighter jet, this one piloted by Lieutenant Parviz Jafari. As Jafari approached the object and got within 27 nautical miles, his radar picked up a lock on the object. The radar signature of the UFO resembled that of a Boeing 707 tanker, but it was difficult to determine the actual size of the UFO due to how damn bright it was. This thing was radiating some intense light. Jafari recalls the light it gave off as that of a flashing strobe light arranged in a rectangular pattern. The colors blue, green, red, and orange were flashing so fast that all could be seen at once. Jafari attempted to pursue the object while flying south of Iran, but this proved rather difficult because the object apparently would change position rapidly. It would even disappear and reappear in a totally different location. Suddenly, the UFO emitted a smaller, bright object heading straight for Jafari's jet. He attempted to launch an AIM-9 heat-seeking missile at the smaller object heading straight towards him, but he had lost all weapons and communication control on board his jet. Jafari then made a swift turn and headed back towards Tehran, but now the second object was chasing him. According to Peruzzi, he saw the second object chasing Jafari's plane, and right as they both passed Medabad Airport, Peruzzi lost communication with the plane, just like before. Jafari performed another negative G5, G-dive, and turned to get away, but the second object broke chase, circled, and headed back for the primary UFO. Then, it was reabsorbed into the primary UFO, like, like an amoeba absorbing a smaller microorganism. 
Once the object was clear of Jafari's jet, he immediately regained control of his communication and weapons systems. Then, Jafari, his radar tower operators, Peruzzi, and Peruzzi's trainees all saw another smaller object emerge from the opposite side of the UFO and drop quickly down to Earth. They braced for a large explosion, but nothing like that happened. The smaller object appeared to come to rest on the ground and cast an extremely bright light in a 2-3 to three kilometer radius. According to Jafari, it was so bright the area looked like daylight, and it took him and his operator a few minutes for their eyes to readjust to the darkness. Jafari then approached the main UFO, which was orbiting the area where the smaller object landed, and again their plane lost all navigational instruments. General Yusefi ordered Jafari to shoot down the main UFO, but Jafari's firing control panel went dead. As Jafari ran low on fuel, he headed back for Maribad Airport, but just as Aziz Khani's plane before him, Jafari had interference in his radio and communication navigational failures in the same spot near the airport as before. That's not all. During his landing, Jafari saw a cylindrical object with bright lights on the ends and a flasher orbiting in the middle exactly like the first object that Peruzzi saw earlier that night. The object passed Jafari overhead. The tower operators even confirmed they also saw the object once Jafari pointed it out. At this point, General Yusefi gave up on the chase. According to Peruzzi, at around 4 a.m., the original UFO climbed upward into the sky and disappeared. The next day, the F-4 crew flew out in a helicopter Uh, to the site where they had seen the smaller object land. In the daylight, uh, it was determined to be a dry lake bed, but no traces of anything could be seen. They then circled the area to the west and picked up a noticeable beeper signal. The signal was loudest near a small house, so they landed and questioned the occupants of the house about any unusual events of the previous night. The occupants reported a loud noise and a bright light, like lightning. Further investigation of the landing site, including uh, radiation testing of the area, was apparently done, but the results were never made public. Since this event occurred before the fall of the Shah, any records in Tehran may be lost. Well, that's quite a UFO encounter if I do say so myself there, Andy boy. (laughs) But hey, our story doesn't end there. Shall we look at the aftermath and the military reaction to this bizarre nightlight show? The sure thing, (laughs) Art. Uh... The next day, the Tehran Journal ran a story about the incident. However, the publication got a few things incorrect. The general gist of the story is there, but there's a few inconsistencies in the details and a lack of cited sources. If you're interested, listeners, a link to these sources can be found, as with all our episodes, in the show notes. They run a follow-up story the day after that on September 21st, this time citing an audio tape between Aziz Khani and the control tower as a source. Unfortunately, the tape was not made public. Curiously, and some might say conveniently, there was another story published as a bold attempt at a cover-up by the Kaihan International Newspaper, also on September 21st. The story cited an unnamed official source who flat-out denied the previous events took place. But not to be outdone by fake news, the Tehran Journal published a summary of Peruzzi's testimony on June 22nd, which corroborated the previous narrative. Let's look into the U.S. and Iranian government involvement involvement in this encounter. The day after the encounter, the Iranian Air Force interviewed the two pilots, Aziz Khani and Jafari, about the incident. The Iranian Air Force Deputy Commander, Lieutenant General Abdullah Azarbarzin, close enough, conducted interviews with all the pilots and wrote up a report. <laughs> However, Lieutenant Colonel Mui of the Military Assistance and Advisory Group, or MAG, sat in on the second pilot, Jafari, uh, his testimony. A secondhand and brief version of the first pilot's testimony was provided to Mui. Mui prepared a teletype message which summarized the results of this interview. His message was the official message that was sent to many U.S. military and intelligence agencies, including the Three Armed Services, the CIA, the National Security Agency, the Defense Intelligence Agency, the U.S. Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, and the White House. Listeners, a link to the actual document is provided in our show notes if you'd like to read it for yourself, uh, as well as sites that have transcribed the memo as, well, it's rather difficult on the eyes to read. But that's not all. 
Later on, more documents revealed some peculiar details about the U.S. government's reaction to this phenomenon. The document was requested for information from the American Embassy in Morocco to the U.S. State Department. It claimed a very similar UFO was sighted in Morocco from many locations about three to four hours later than the Iran incident on the 19th of September. It had a silvery, luminous, circular, or tubular shape and was giving off intermittent trails of bright sparks and fragments. It made no noise. Ten days later, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger gave an official response to the U.S. position on UFOs. Kissinger claimed the Condon Committee report had shown that all UFOs could be attributed to natural causes and no further study was warranted. The Condon Committee formed after the U.S. Air Force's own investigation into the UFO phenomenon, Project Bluebeam, something we've mentioned a lot here on this oh, yeah. uh, very podcast. The Condon Committee um, essentially concluded that, quote, nothing has come from the study of UFOs in the past 21 years that has added to scientific knowledge, end quote, and it also, quote, recommended against the creation of a government program to investigate UFO reports, end quote. Now, this might all seem well and dandy, Andy, <laughs> but on October 12th, Colonel Roland Evans wrote an evaluation of the Mui memo for the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency, in which he deemed the memo and the encounter highly informative and reliable, further stating that it met all the criteria necessary for a valid study of UFOs. Furthermore, in 1978, Captain Henry Shields published a summary of the case in an internal Air Force newsletter. Now, to be fair, it was just a simple sum summary of the, of the Mui memo, but kind of points to interest in the case from the Air Force, even though the government's official statement was to disregard this incident. This was all in spite of the fact that the U.S. Air Force had recently closed its investigation of the UFO phenomenon, again known as Project Blue Book, a topic that deserves its own episode, certainly. All right, so this incident happened. Everyone experienced something, right? It got a little weird. The military got involved. This is all sounding like a couple of toga parties I threw at my Nana's retirement home. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Nana likes to get down. Toga, toga. <laughs> a weekend at Nana's. Anyway, up until this point, only the military and local Iranians knew about the encounter and all of the military memos and documentation was classified. So how did this get spread to the public? Well, I'll tell you. Shields' memo eventually gets leaked to the to NICAP, or National Investigation Committee on Aerial Phenomenon, an independent organization that investigates UFO encounters. NICAP runs the story in their newsletter, and some of the other documents get declassified shortly after. First on the scene was Bob Pratt, a UFO investigator with the National Enquirer, who interviewed Peruzzi twice in 1976, as well as Mackenzie Evans and the deputy commander of the Iranian Air Force, all of whom confirmed what was presented in the press. Later in 1982, Bruce Maccabee, an American optical physicist with NICAP, did his own investigation of the encounter and wrote an extensively detailed report. Listeners, it is the opinion of this co-host, by the way, that Maccabee's report is the most comprehensive on the encounter and will be linked in the show notes. It's a great read. Aside from a uh, writing a stellar review of the events, Maccabee also spoke to the avionics engineers who maintained the jets at Sharuki and Medabad. Uh, they were not allowed to examine the jets for four days after the incident until the Iranian Air Force had a chance to look them over. Now, uh, but as with most topics we cover, when investigators get involved, uh, get more involved, I should say, with them, so do high-profile skeptics, right, Andy? I would agree with that. What do some of the major skeptics of this encounter have to say? Hmm. <laughs> Philip Class, a noted UFO skeptic. Real class act. A real class act. Investigated the Tehran UFO for his 1983 book, UFOs, The Public Deceived. Class claimed the witnesses initially saw a astronomical body, probably the planet Jupiter, and pilot incompetence and equipment malfunction accounted for the rest. He breaks it down like this. The pilots, Peruzzi, everybody, they saw Jupiter. That's the object. The beacons or the fireballs that the main, quote, UFO shot at them, that the, the smaller bits that chased them, those were just meteor showers. Meanwhile, their plane's radar malfunctioned, all while an undocumented flight dropped a beacon near the lake bed. There's some debate over the validity of Class's research. 
Glass spoke with, quote, unnamed officials in Tehran and, quote, unnamed American engineers who worked on the jets, but as well as, you know, consulting the Iranian news reports and the movie memo. However, he did not take into account the testimony of the main witnesses involved in the case, that is, Peruzzi, Aziz Khani, Jafari, Yousefi, etc. Skeptics like Class also claim that only the second jet, piloted by Jafari, malfunctioned due to the UFO, whereas most of the UFOologists and the official records say that both jets malfunctioned. Overall, Class claims an enormous amount of incompetence on the pilots and the Iranians, saying that engineers claim the pilots were extremely tired and poorly trained and prone to error. Most skeptical explanations of this encounter build off of Klaas's book. For example, Brian Dunning of the award-winning audio program Skeptoid. Hey, award-winning! Just like us, Art. What award did we win? The Ira Glass presents Two Stupid Fucks Who Are a Disgrace to Radio and Audio Entertainment Award. Oh, right. Yeah, the trophy is a pile of Ira Glass's dog's poop in a bag, and he lit it on fire and rang the bunker doorbell and pranked our asses. Uh, oh, yeah. We got pranked by Ira Glass. Boy. Ira Glass was a better pranker than me on Funked. Yikes. Well, anyway. Anyway. Brian Dunning of Skeptoid breaks down the encounter into six main points that he refutes. They are as follows. Number one. Burning up the charts at number one. Casey Keenum. Casey Keenum, quarterback and radio DJ. <laughs> uh, number one, Shields report in the Air Force newsletter. Uh, it's just a dramatized retelling of the same information in Colonel Mui's memo, offered in the newsletter as a curious editorial on the subject of jamming and interference. Number two, the mothership. Dunning agrees with Class's explanation that it was probably Jupiter. Number three, jamming and electronics failure of the jets. Dunning cites class again. He says the second F-4 had a long history of intermittent electrical outages that the IIAF had never been able to fix. Number four, the radar lock by Jafari that relayed the Boeing 707 size to the U of the UFO. Again, according to the skeptics, Jafari's radar was known to be defective. Number five, UFO missiles, or the smaller objects, fired at Jafari. Dunning says this could be debris from Halley's Comet, as twice a year the Earth passes through a big portion of it, and on September 19, 1976, we were at a maximum of two minor meteor showers. This could explain why we got reports of this all over the Mediterranean. Dunning also says that Kloss states the pilots had never done night flights. Number six, beeper found in in the lake bed afterward. This was just a beeping transponder from an American C-141. They had issues with them objecting from turbulence. Dunning concludes uh, his research with this, quote, and in this case, we don't have enough information to know what it is. So even if any of the six elements is not otherwise explained, all we're left with is I don't know, not I do know and it was an alien spaceship. What was the Tehran 1976 UFO? I don't know, but there's insufficient evidence to convince me to get excited about it, end quote. So, Andy, we've talked about the encounter as it was reported. We've talked about the U.S. and government had to say about it. We talked about what Class and Dunning had to say. But what about the actual witnesses, the pilots and the tower control operators? What do they say went down that night? Well, Art, the Iranian government actually made a film about the incident that starred many of the real witnesses involved in the encounter. Later, many of the same witnesses, including Peruzzi, Aziz Khani, and Jafari, and General Azerbaijan, who were in the film, later appeared on the television show Sightings about the encounter. Nearly all expressed the opinion that they were dealing with a high-technology extraterrestrial craft. Aziz Khani, the first pilot, estimated that the UFO was traveling somewhere between two and 3,000 miles per hour. He said that the object, quote, was beyond my speed and power. The later F-4 also could not catch up to the object. That's when I thought, this is a UFO. End quote. He added that, quote, no country had this type of flying object, so I was thinking this craft is from another planet. End quote. 
Jafari said that after attempting to fire his missiles at the UFO and failing, he feared for his life and tried to eject himself from the aircraft, but the eject button didn't work. Jafari also spoke at a conference at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. in 2007. Many government and military officials attended this conference in which Jafari stated he believes he saw an alien spacecraft. If you, dear listeners, want to watch Jafari speak at this conference, a link to the video is in our show notes. Right you are, Art. 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 Right you are. Oh, I get it. Art. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Anyway. That checks out. There you go. Tower controller Peruzzi was also among those interviewed for the show. He recalled a discussion by Azerbaijan's panel at the conclusion of the meeting. When they heard our report, uh, this is a quote, when they heard our report and the report of the pilots, they concluded that no country is capable of such technology, and all of them believed it was a strange object from outer space, end quote. When interviewed by sightings, Azerbaijan independently confirmed Peruzzi's statement. He said they concluded that the UFO had deliberately jammed both the aircraft and control tower electronics. About the objects that seemed to shoot out of the UFO, Azerbaijan said, The pilots called them fireballs, but we all thought that they were very powerful waves of electromagnetism, which jammed all the electronics starting from VHF, UHF, fire control system, gun radar, gun communications, everything. Everything was gone. The Tehran UFO incident truly is one of the most interesting UFO counters to date. Multiple eyewitnesses, from experienced military jet pilots to civilians on the ground, all saw the same bizarre entities up in the sky. Listeners, where do you stand on this case? You side with the skeptics and conclude, this was just the planet Jupiter or pieces of Halley's Comet. Or do you side with the believers, convinced this was a real extraterrestrial encounter? Well, come along on Bunker Jet. Let's hit Mach 2, headed straight for our discussion at Enchilada Airport. Mr. Bunker's Conspiracy Time podcast will be right back after this brief message. What's up, everybody? I'm Richard. And I'm Sean. And together, we are the duo that speaks the language of bromance every single Sunday. Since 2014, we have brought free funny to the podcasting world by entertaining millions. Because each week, we travel the world for odd stories and even odder events in history, you know, to play around with or improv around. We've brought tales of emus fighting man, the 70-year-old ninja Hasai, and the great Bigfoot war, just to name a few. We'll even discuss some of the best movies, TV shows, and even, you know, pitch our own movie or two. We've been featured as a podcast by the Smodco Pod U Group, and we have performed live at the Chicago Podcast Festival. So what you need to do is subscribe to The Language of Bromance wherever you get your podcasts and fill your ear holes every single Sunday. That's The Language of Bromance where we always say, why not? Welcome back, listeners. That was our research of the Tehran UFO of 1976. <laughs> Tehran Rock City. <laughs> ah, want to look at UFOs <laughs> and party every day. <laughs> Kiss was there. Yeah. We solved it. It was Kiss. It was Kiss. They were up in their big Kiss spaceship. That was Gene Simmons' tongue that descended to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, wow. What a story, Art. Andy, what a story. I mean, whew, that was a detailed encounter. Wow. I mean, a lot of documents, a lot of shit. Yeah, this is not, this is not your average saw a craft in the sky and got two seconds of grainy handheld right. camcorder footage of it. Oh, yeah. Fucking, am- this is not amateur, you know, grainy footage of, you know, doggy style. UFO encounters, 
I mean, this is not like some home video that you find on a website of someone cowgirling. Yeah, this a UFO, is not not, you know? not amateur milf UFOs here. <laughs> this is this is very uh, professional. Good production values on this. Uh, I don't UFO know story. I don't know what I'm gonna say. The I don't verdict. either. I don't know what to think of this one. It's crazy. Um, just want to throw this out uh, to you at the start, Art, and I think that you probably could guess that I would say something similar to this, is that typically when we consider a UFO sighting, I'm usually on the side of the skeptics. Uh, we talked briefly at one point about Roswell, uh, and I tend to be on the side of the skeptics with that. That uh, we talked about those uh, weather balloons. Weather balloons, yeah. That this was just a big weather balloon, and it made a lot of sense to me. And so I typically tend to be on the side of the skeptics when there's, I mean, for a lot of things. I mean, I'm a skeptic by nature. Yeah. This one, I don't know. The skeptics, uh, the skeptics, uh, uh, like the the explanation provided by the skeptics i guess is what i want to say that explanation is pretty darn convoluted in my opinion a little bit you know and let's be i mean is there some there's a lot they say like the, there's a lot of incompetence on these pilots i feel like you can't make that call cuz i'm in no position to judge i'm in no position to judge how am i supposed to you could as much as you get, like, I don't know. I don't know them. Maybe and they were, maybe they weren't. Then say, the Jets had a history of maintenance problems. Is that real? Is that just somebody was like, oh, yeah, that Jets always fucked up. I mean, was it real or not? These I don't know. These were American Jets. Yeah. That's why we included <laughs> yeah. that history of Iran, because you have to understand, this is like, these are the same Jets America was using at the time. These yeah. Phantom F4s, those lasted, uh, I think, well until the 90s. Yeah. When they think, got replaced. I think that's right, Art. I don't know that for a fact, but with some other kind of jet plane. That was like uh, that was the you, you said we Vietnam. said it, the big this Vietnam. was the yeah, big the Vietnam jet, jet plane. Vietnam, yeah. They were still using them in the seventies, and I have to assume that you know if these are American U.S. backed military uh, weapons, that well, you know, one thing about it is that like like very complicated pieces of equipment like this require routine maintenance and stuff, and. If you get a bunch of these jets, but you really don't have people who know how to maintain them properly, sure, sure they're probably subject to mechanical failure. But they were Americans, like that. yeah, working on them. So yeah. even if you're like, uh, it's like you're writing a UFO book in the '80s and you hate Iran because, you know, some shit went down, <laughs> revolution happened, and there was a lot of anti-Iranian uh, sentiment. I mean, I think that's fair mm -hmm. to say. Ayatollah Asahola. <laughs> You remember very fondly. <laughs> you were one of the hostages in the in the Iranian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know how I got out. They weren't. Uh, I wasn't part of the deal. You're just kind of hanging out. Yeah, yeah. I was there on a scholarship. Uh, they were actually. They they wanted to give you away. That was actually yeah. the big deal. Yeah, Iran was like, we're not. We will do anything to get rid of this person. You were kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back. They were like, we cannot. You literally, I broke a camel's back. <laughs> And then Iran had it. They were like done. Yeah. They was, needed to get rid of a, the shot. It was a famed <laughs> racing camel, and I was too big a load for its its back. And that's what caused the Iranian revolution. And that was that. They said, enough is enough. Get this guy out of our country. Get him back to the USA where he belongs. No, but you know what I'm saying? Like. There was pretty strong anti-Iranian sentiment after that, and... You know, oh, yeah. so to sit there and assume that these pilots are, like, poorly trained, they were tired. I mean, maybe they were. I don't know. Tired, sure. I mean, it's fucking, this happens at, like, 1 You wake me up at 1.30 a.m. and ask me to go fly a F-4 at a UFO, I'll probably be sleepy. But, like, military guys, that's what they train for. Right. They're good mm -hmm. at that kind of shit. Yeah, that's what they're supposed to, that's what they're supposed to do. I can't, I can't sway the level of human incompetence to one side or the other with this. Mm -hmm. I have to, you just have to take it at like face value. I feel like, like just assume these guys were good pilots who wanted to do their job. Yeah. I guess one thing about it is that Iran never documents anything that seems to call into question the character of the people providing right. statements or saying they're incompetent. Now, I mean, you could, like you said, maybe this is part of some deeper 
attempt to make all of Iran look very incompetent. <laughs> and so, you know, there's nobody good to judge the competence of these people because everybody there is really incompetent. And that might be a concerted effort by the, the U.S. government to make that seem plausible. But nothing else uh, aside from this, uh, besides Kloss's report, seems to call into question the competency of the Iranian people right. involved in this. So as we mentioned, Bruce Maccabee, when he did his investigation of the report, you know, and those avionics engineers were like, yeah, we weren't allowed to look at the jets for four days after they looked at them. Um, they were like, yeah, there was nothing wrong with them. You yeah. Couldn't find anything wrong. Yeah. I, I mean, maybe they went there and they fixed them up before they could get in. But I feel like, I, I don't know. It, these planes aren't just like, I sometimes I feel like with a plane, like you'd be able to tell. I don't know. I'm I've never worked on a plane. <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea. I know that planes have things like, um, you know, IFF wings. codes. Oh, so that they, can, they have what wings? Yeah, they have wings, and um, some have widow wheels, and uh, there's a pilot and a uh, uh, cockpit. Yeah, I'm a widow baby. <laughs> you are a cutie. I'm a little baby, short and stout. Here is my handle. Here is my spout. <laughs> Play, uh, jet planes have IFF codes, which kind of like can identify friend or foe. Yeah. So that you're not just, you know, shooting down people. <laughs> Flying blind, so to speak. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm not a fucking jet engine. I'm not a jet plane yet. Uh, I hope to be one day. <laughs> he does look at a lot of jet plane hentai, though, folks. <laughs> yeah. I hey folks, I just got done masturbating to a bunch of airplane porn, and boy, are my arms tired. <laughs> Woo. Okay, thanks. Um. All right. So I don't know, Andy. What do you? I mean, where do we want to start here? I guess just with the encounter itself. Yeah, let's talk about this craft. We have always said on this show that we think UFOs could take some weird fucking form or something. That's what I love about this story. There'll be some inco- This isn't like a saucer. This yeah. is a uh, weird light, and it's blinking, and it's morphing and changing shape. Pieces are coming off of it and going back to it. It, it, it feels like something that, I don't know, that is a more not of our world, of our physical nature. It sounds like somebody had a Simon toy, <laughs> and it got melted in a microwave or something. Like it looked nice, but then it got too hot, and it turned into a droopy starfish. Um, that's one aspect of this story that I thought a lot about. Um, reading this research is that uh, this this seems like what we would want a ufo to be yeah this doesn't this is not just oh it kind of looked like a jet or this it it's totally outside of this earth yeah i mean you're right andy it 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 does look outside of this earth is this some weird race of gaseous sentient life that communicates through colors that's what we've always wanted gaseous (laughs) sentient life yes it's true We've wanted something that's not bound to a physical form like we're used to on Earth. I mean, uh, yeah. from the descriptions, I mean, obviously we're working off of descriptions. There's no footage. So I, I don't know anything about planets. I know that you can see the moon, but like, <laughs> you know, can you see Jupiter and see Jupiter that it's so bright that it looks like this giant thing and why is it tilting back and forth and I mean it just seems like the skeptical answers to this are so like and I, you know things happen weird things happen statistically they're anomalies but like two jets malfunction <laughs> and lose all their communication radio navigation right. uh, guns ejecting but they still fly just fine uh, at the same time that Jupiter is seen in the sky, at the same time as Haley Co- Haley's Comet is passing overhead, at the same time as a random aircraft drops a beacon somewhere that people can... I mean, like, that's like four or five fucking things that yeah. have to all happen at the same exact time. It just I have, seems I like have too much, much. I have much less an issue with saying, oh, the 
visible Jupiter at the same time that we're passing through the tail of Halley's comet at the, you know, uh, that, that kind of stuff I have no problem with, frankly, because it, it's going to happen, you know, like that stuff is bound to happen just because it's, it's a, it's recurring phenomena. It doesn't, it doesn't need a bunch of extra factors to influence. It's just stuff that's going to happen on its own. Um, you know, I think that the idea of a meteor kind of shower sort of makes sense when you talk about it being all over the Mediterranean because it really was the sightings were rolling yeah. with the uh, horizon, basically. Yeah. yeah so yeah. it was in Tehran, and then it just gradually, you hear more as it goes further to the west. Right. Uh, culminating then with those reports in Morocco. So in my opinion, there's some... That gives some standing, I guess, to the argument that it's a meteor shower. But I agree The just all of this is happening at the same time. People are experiencing it. People are freaked out about it. They happen to have a jet in the sky at the exact moment that an unknown, unmarked, unnamed airplane is dropping a huge flare. And why were they dropping this flare? Right. And then it just so happens that the next day they come by and they find a a beeping uh, transponder from an American plane. I mean, it's like there's so many little things. And maybe the transponder's been there for a while. I don't know. But it just – it starts to go off the rails a little bit there for me. A little bit. I think I'm with you. And I think the thing that really ties me up is how the planes malfunction. You know, I agree with you on this, although I'll say this uh, to play devil's advocate against myself. They probably didn't know that weapons systems and all that wasn't working until they needed it. True. So maybe it wasn't working, and it's not like they tried to fire a missile after they flew, after other stuff came back online. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, obviously navigational stuff, they probably noticed that that was gone right away. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe maybe they do know right away that the that the weapon systems are disarmed or or not functioning. I mean, the tower's radar was fucked up and being repaired, but yeah, the that's just the Metabod airport. Like that's not their yeah. military base, right? Uh, I just it's so bizarre that it happened to both the planes at the same time, because as far as I know, EMP technology does is not that advanced still to this day. There's fear of it existing. There is fear of that, like the the new weapon being a non-nuclear EMP. But uh, one that could target an airplane and only take out its radar and communications and navigation stuff. Yeah, not just sink the whole plane. Yeah, that's like not like black out the whole fucking city. Is there any uh, speculation that this is some sort of astronomical electromagnetic event that messed with the instrumentation? It could have. I mean, obviously, um, Maccabee kind of looked into that radar lock that they did. So they they did that radar lock, and they right. like got the Boeing 747. And some skeptics, I think, kind of say, like, oh, well, it probably locked onto some, like, glare coming off like the the mountains yeah the top top of a mountain or something but they kind of disproved that when they said that like it locked on for like almost a full minute or something yeah like 40 seconds or something and then would typically unlock from a mountaintop right after like three seconds or something so i don't know man it's it's bizarre to me and i mean obviously all the pilots you know they kind of all agree like we fucking saw something up there yeah the pilots i mean pilots Testimonies I don't think should be discounted no. heavily because they're actually closest to it and it, I think I think if it's true that the pilots didn't have night flying experience, that's probably a big factor because everything looks so much different at night when you're flying. You're just seeing light. But yeah, but people who know who fly at night regularly, if they see something like to me, bats. yeah. Yeah, if a bat sees something, to me, that's a big thing. Yeah. That's important. So It's kind of a big if. I, I mean, if they, if they have the night flying experience and they're not rookies at these nighttime adventures, then, I mean, I think that lends more credence to it being actually something weird rather than a naturally occurring phenomenon. Because probably if they'd seen something like this before, if it really was Jupiter, somebody would have said, oh, that's just Jupiter. 
Yeah. That's just a planet that you're, you're, it's messing with your eyes because of this and this. Yeah. You know, the shape though is so bizarre. Like, yeah, that's another thing that kind of gets me is it's like everyone kind of agreed. They saw this weird drooping fan shape. Yeah. The thing about it is that the, the thing changes shape, planet. but it's not inconsistent stories. Right. People see it change shape. So they all are reporting the same shapes. It's not that, you know, Yusefi sees a fan. Yeah. And I then, saw it as a duck. Yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> oh, look more like a it horse is, to yeah, me. something totally different. They all see the same thing. Yeah. Basically. Fidget spinners. They're all a bunch of little Fidget millennials. Spinners. Those are millennials. I mean, okay, boomer. <laughs> That's what I fucking say. You know, they're coming up to me saying, yeah, so you for this guy. I say, okay, boomer. Okay, boomer. <laughs> Asias, and thanks for being here. Uh, I want to talk about your great career with the Cincinnati Bengals. <laughs> Cincinnati Bengals, truly a Rawr, wonderful organization. Yeah. Um, what do we think about? Uh, you know, I, I guess we could also say this. I wrote down this. Given the economic and civil unrest in Iran at the time, I could see how maybe the Jets wouldn't be working properly. <laughs> Yeah, I suppose. I mean, there's a factor if this is a if this is a you know a stressed economy as it was. Perhaps there was not proper funding for the maintenance and upkeep of things in use by the armed services. But obviously, you know, the U.S. had to have been supplying them something. Yeah. So, although I, I think that this is fairly common, is I mean, nations can acquire. Technology that at the time they acquire it is is maybe not state of the art, but yeah. is very serviceable, and like kind of how when we helped support the Afghanistan against when they were at war with Russia, right, right. They don't have you know if you don't have a pipeline to someone who's producing new equipment, you end up with a bunch of obsolete equipment eventually, right? Um, just through time and usage, if you don't have the proper money to maintain it, then yeah, these things are probably going to be m malfunctioning and pilots are probably going to understand that though and have be able to work around it. Yeah. Obviously these pilots, they didn't have any problems when their panels went out. Yeah. They, they didn't crash. And yeah. Blah! <laughs> it's not like they did. So maybe this is something that's common. Yeah. You know, maybe they're used to it. They all stayed in the military too, and like Jafari graduated or graduated, retired as a general. Graduated as a general. Congratulations. Graduated from military U. Um, what about what do you think of the military kind of poo-pooing and the government poo-pooing the idea of a UFO, even though they were kind of secretly interested in it being a UFO? What do you think about that? Um, I think that that's pretty in line with what with what governments do yeah. generally. Um, you know, we've seen it with the U.S. government, of course. There's a lot of cover-ups to things. Um, the the government acts secretly. Um, you know, I'll go back to Roswell. Sometimes it's for a really mundane reason. At the time, those weather balloons in Roswell were top secret. Right. Because they were going to use that to... Mogul. Yeah, they were... Mogul. <laughs> they were going to use that to spy on Russian uh, nuclear tests underground. Um, but, you know, eventually that it's not a big deal because they never went through with it. They found other ways to do it. Um, but at the time, those mogul balloons were top secret. So the government couldn't just come out and tell us because then Soviets would have found out. And then that there's one thing that you've just wasted yeah. all your energy into trying to do clandestinely because now the Soviet knows Soviets know about it. So they'll just be able to see it coming. Um, so I, I think that typically that's just how governments react is that yeah. they're not going to come out and say a whole lot. And part of the problem, honestly, with true believers, sometimes I think in my opinion now, I mean, listeners, Burn me down for this. I'm okay with that. Light him on fire. Light me on fire. End it for me. Uh, is the true believer sometimes, if there's a denial, 
it's like, well, that's just proof that they're yeah. You know, if if the government came out and said, well, this is not a UFO. It may not just be because they're covering up something. They may just genuinely not believe that it was a UFO, yeah. that it was, they might believe this guy. I mean, there's your proof. <laughs> yeah. Cover up. There it is. But I mean, who knows? I, I, I don't know. There's no more. I kind of like when you denied uh, jerking off to Garfield porn, hot Garfs. Right. And every time you denied it, me and all my cool friends were just like, well, there, hey, you denied it. You supplied it. Yeah, you denied it. You supplied it. Yeah, I when mean, you release a fart. Yeah. You can't deny you released that fart. Right, because then you supplied it. Right. Now, eventually you learn you just right. got to own that fart. Right, and I do. And it's just like the way that I owned up to <laughs> masturbating to hot garfs. And <laughs> everyone found that video of me masturbating to hot garfs. You just became the hot garf guy. Yeah. I mean, the webcam was on. <laughs> You need help with technology. And you could clearly see that I had printed on my inkjet printer hot garfs onto a sheet of copy paper. And you also had your social security number and your birth certificate up so people could confirm it was 100% you. Right. And I always have a copy of my ID pinned to my shirt. So, And I masturbate with my shirt on. And uh, before you get started, you always like to state your full name and address. Yeah. I do like to do that. I mean, <laughs> it just kind of gets me in the mood. Yeah. It's sort of a Pavlovian thing. I, I mean, all I'm saying is if we had the hot garf situation with Tehran, we would have no questions. Like if you <laughs> were involved. Would be very clear. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it would be, everyone would know exactly what happened. Full transparency. <laughs> I, I feel like they kind of sound like Officer Bar Brady, where they're like, nothing to see here. Move along. Move along, folks. What happened to him? Uh, I don't, I don't like remember. not on the show anymore. Yeah, I think they moved on from him. Because yeah. he was from another time. True. Maybe maybe the government had no idea maybe. what the fuck that it was. Maybe, maybe they were just like, we don't know. Could be the Russians. Yeah. Could be not. I don't yeah. know. Let's just stop talking about it and hope it goes away. Yeah. I mean, it seems it seems people freak out that like Mui sent the memo to all these branches. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, I mean, that is a little odd. Yeah. Sure. It just seems like they had no idea what was going on. Yeah. He's like, probably trying to cast a wide net. Then, yeah. I mean, you know, if they really felt like this was, they were talking about shooting it down. So clearly, Yusefi at least feels like this is potential threat to Iranian national security. It seems only likely that their best ally, so to speak, would get, they would sort of pepper our bureaucracy with this memo to try to get people right. looking at it. Right. Yeah. I don't know. Um, it's tough and there's not really a lot of open endedness. It's just kind of like, you just kind of have to put your foot down and say, what do you think? Yeah. Um, yeah. You just have to, there's no, it's not, it's not like so many of these where I find a skeptical solution, very compelling. I find yeah. this, Partly compelling, but not enough to sway me. I find holes, yeah, holes in both sides of the stories. Like right. The skeptics are like, here's what happened. With all UFOs sightings, we just don't know enough. We have no evidence. Nobody's right. ever recovered a craft. Nobody's ever, I mean, I know that's debatable, but I'm just saying, I mean, officially, we've never recovered an extraterrestrial craft. Right. You can't go see the UFO craft in the I museum. can't go somewhere and look. I mean, I can't go to Wright Pad in the Aviation Museum and look at a... At a flying disc. At a LT-3400 lightweight cruiser, a.k.a. the Millennium Falcon. I fucked up the Millennium Falcon, and someone's going to roast my ass for it. Roast him! <laughs> Listeners, get him. He deserves it. His ego's out of control. <laughs> I don't know the exact uh, ship model of the Millennium Falcon. <laughs> I'm sorry. Wow. This has been Falcon awesome. I really... Falcon punch! My favorite drink at a party. <laughs> Gives a you a falcon kick. Oh, my testicles. Yeah, I don't know, Andy. I mean, uh, I feel like we could just talk in circles about this all damn day. Yeah, I don't think that uh, we're going to come to any kind of conclusion because I think uh, what I'm gauging from you, I think, is the exact same thing that I'm putting out to you, which is that... Your stench? Is that I... Reek. There are cartoonish... 
green lines floating off of your body. And those are floating right into your nostrils. I can see it. And my nostrils are opening up. That's lifting me up. Yeah, you're floating, uh, borne aloft by my smell. You got funked. <laughs> Fuck! I got funked! Got funked! Oh shit! Funked returns. Oh, Catch no. me on YouTube every day for the rest of existence. <laughs> um. Yeah, I don't. I think. I think that we're in the same place. There is not enough information here to either confirm or deny what happened. This was certainly a very, very strange event, and um. I think, as we both agree, a pretty cool description of a UFO. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is a neat little UFO, a hot, sexy little UFO. <laughs> you see tic tac shaped uh, UFOs a lot. <laughs> what? tic tac shaped tic tac shaped Oh, like a tic tac um, Yeah. Capsules? Like the, the cylindrical shape. That's not uncommon. Yeah. That's been seen before, but the droopy fan blade... Starfish looking thing. That's it, weird. You know, uh, he, uh, you know, they first see it as a cylinder with something, a red light orbiting yeah. the cylinder, and then mm -hmm. it moves into a half circle, semicircle that the, uh, the trainees see. And then it gets into this, you know, a fan shape and then a droopy fan shape. Uh, it's just, there's so many iterations. And I, it's I like wish... I said, that people see it consistently. Yeah. Is the thing that gets me. It's yeah. not. It's not one person seeing it one way. It's a bunch of people seeing it in a bunch of different ways. Yeah. Um. I just. Uh. I, I wish I knew more about planets so that I could dive into like how could Jupiter look like a droopy fan blade. Yeah. Like I feel like you can't like seeing Jupiter with your naked eye. Like how could it ever be big enough and bright enough that it's as bright as the sun or the moon? Yeah. I mean, I've seen Jupiter through, like, pictures of high-powered telescopes, and that looks great. But, like, there there are certain times where you can see Jupiter, but it's like it looks like a tiny little pin. Jupiter looks like a pinprick, really, in yeah. the background of space. But it is very bright. I mean, to be honest, because it's such a large – it's a massive body that's very close to us, much closer, obviously, than stars. Yeah. And so it looks pretty bright in the night sky. I mean, if you if you look at the night sky at uh, dusk, you can usually see Jupiter really well because it it really stands out. Uh, Are you a little back. stargazer? I've, I've I've looked at some stars as they get out of the bath. Sure. Uh, oh, I forgot that out. stint you did as a paparazzo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nobody ate my pizza. Yeah, uh, you broke into Phil Hartman's house. Yeah, that was me. R.I.P. This got dark. Sorry, everybody. This took a turn. It's got weird. Yikes. Anyway, you're a little stargazer, huh? I like to look at the stars. Sure, I like to look at the heavenly bodies. You, you ever been I mean? up in the planetarium or something? Mm, no, I've never been. Uh, you got a, your own little local microscope? I haven't been to the space yet, um, but um, I'm in talks with Elon Musk. <laughs> You, you're the one who designed that stupid Cybertruck, right? Yeah. That yeah, was you? Yeah, that was me. Uh, they said, the name of it is Cybertruck. And I said, say no more. <laughs> I'm going to design a truck I want to internet chat with. <laughs> Sexy internet chat with. Yeah, so you ASL'd that truck. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, baby. Um, I don't think I've ever done much stargazing in my life. Mm. But I'm not out from the country like you are. Yeah, it's harder in the city, but you can see shitty. Jupiter in the city. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. It's uh, that's it's like I said, it's very bright. But do you think it could be as bright enough to like be the thing in this story? No, if they're described in a city, when they, when they describe it like a sun or like daylight, I no, it they're it, in Tehran, the yeah. biggest city in Iran. <laughs> I, I mean, I think the the capital the, for sure. Yeah, it definitely is. Uh, the capital. I mean, th they're not only at that, Andy. They're at a airport base. Right. So there's lights. Lights everywhere. They're still reportedly seeing this thing that bright. Yeah. And I think that's the thing that, I mean, the fact that it's not drowned out by other light pollution near sources of light tells me that it's very bright. And it's moving across the sky. There, there are points where they describe it being able to just 
disappear and reappear. You know, sometimes the sky looks funny because of things that happen on Earth. You know, uh, swamp gas, for example. You know, uh, swamp gas. It can look like things are shimmering in the sky yeah. because of those like wavy form you of can the see Shrek. gas. Yeah, you can see swamp Shrek. Go ahead, donkey. Get out of my swamp. <laughs> Get out of my swamp! <laughs> it's me, Mrs. Doubtfire. <laughs> Mrs. Doubtfire reprising her role as Shrek. <laughs> Little known fact. Now you know it. Um, but hey, I don't you make know. up a good point. You bring up a good point. But I don't know that the uh, the phenomenon uh, that that I know about at least matches this description. Uh, it's easy to say sometimes I think that people see something weird and it's their mind playing a trick on them or their eyes playing a trick on them. Flywood's monster. Yeah, but to have so many people in so many disparate locations see the exact same kind of thing, uh, the fact that the account from Tehran is similar to the account from Morocco, it it lends credence, I think, to say that there's something unusual going on. Yeah. And this isn't, like we said, it's not a goofy fucking saucer. It's not a, uh, doesn't look like a friggin' Star Wars ship. It's just yeah. this weird object that's bright. And uh, it just kind of hung out and then left. I don't know. Meteorites make more sense to me, honestly, than Jupiter itself. Yeah. Because those would be mobile. Yeah. For one, Jupiter's going to be moving very slow across the sky. Uh, these meteorites would be moving relatively pretty fast in the sky. Um, they're probably reflective uh, as they're coming in through the atmosphere. There's a bright pop of light. I mean, does it fit the description really that everything here? I don't think so, but it makes more sense to me than just saying it's Jupiter. Yeah, I mean, uh, but can they travel at the weird... Because now you're kind of like saying like, okay, well, you're a pilot inside of a jet plane going that fucking fast, Mach 2, half or like half the speed of sound. Like the way stuff travels around you probably looks so weird and so different. That's true. I didn't think about the speed aspect. You know, they're saying they see it past them and go over the city and it's like. Right. uh, You know, we can't know because we weren't there with them. We can't see what that looks like. But I just know from when you travel in an airplane or when you travel in a car, the way that the world around you travels with you looks super different. Yeah, your relationship to objects changes based so on your travel. Maybe it looks like these meteors are following them. Maybe it looks like these meteors are chasing them in some way. Uh, maybe it looks like, maybe that's what makes them look like they disappear and reappear. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what kind of phenomenon these would be. That would be, I just, I, I mean, I just have to go back to it. I just don't think that the skeptical suggestion in this case is, is super compelling. Okay. Like maybe there's, maybe there is a good skeptical, um, solution for this, but the one that was given, I don't know. It just doesn't. It doesn't get me there. Calling you out, Brian Dunning. Yep, Brian Dunning. You fucking handsome, deep-voiced motherfucker. (laughs) You award-winning. You award-winning fuck. Yeah, well, you don't have the Ira Glass Award. Ira Glass presents. Two stupid fucks. It's not Ira Glass didn't give this award. He just presents this award. He present this award. Uh, Two stupid fucks who are disgraced to radio and audio entertainment award. Uh, That's us. We won that. We earned it. We earned it. But if you guys want to put us up for like a Webby or when the Chicago Reader does the best of I mean, like, sure we that would, would do anything. That would, would be awesome. awesome. Like we would do anything. Anything. Like anything you want. <laughs> Whatever. You just name it. We'll do it. Twice. We we're, we're very yeah, vain. Of us we're petty. We love um, attention. We Yeah. We're total fame whores. We don't <laughs> care. Get at us. Come over. We'll let you fucking beat us up. You want to hit me with a two by four all day? Fine. You want to piss on us? You want to do whatever? I mean, whatever. we're into it. We're, we'll get it we done. We love it. We're horny for it. Come on. <laughs> come come over and do it. Come over and do it. Come over and do it. Arr, Adrian, come over and do it. Oh, no, that's wrong. Uh, Adrian, it's me, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Rocky. 
I got confused and went to the wrong set. <laughs> Stallone. <laughs> Do you know Arnold Schwarzenegger would like play mind games with people and he would convince, he convinced, he read a script and then convinced Sylvester Stallone to take the script because it was terrible. And he like read it and knew it was terrible. And then he was like, oh, Sly, you need to do this movie. Yeah. So he like actively tried to tarnish other people's careers. What did that movie turn out to be? Uh, it's the one where Sylvester Stallone teams up with his mom and they're both cops. Wow. Yeah. Even Arnold re read it and uh, uh, was like, oh, God, this is fucking terrible. I'm not going to do this. Oh, God. Stop or my mom will shoot. Oh, the yeah. The 1992 uh, box office smash hit with a 8% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Oh, that's a good one. 1992. Yep, he tricked him. Schwarzenegger tricked him uh, to do that. Oh, film. Sylvester Stallone and Estelle Getty. Estelle Getty, uh, who was the older Golden Girl on Golden Girls. Right. Uh, B. Arthur's character's mother. Mm -hmm. Sophia. I've never seen Golden Girls, but you know. Wow. Thank you for being a friend. I wanna thank you. Um, Andy, what do you think? Should we just get to our verdicts? Yeah, let's get to our verdicts. I don't know where you're gonna go with this. I don't know where you're gonna go with this. Hey, Ving Rames was in that movie too. <laughs> Arby's he has the beef. Yeah. They have the meats. He's got the meats. I can't Arby's, do Arby's. We have the meats. Arby's. I could never do a Ving Rhames. Oh my god, it's no too... way. This voice is way too deep. Yeah. And we're nowhere near manly enough. No, I'm not a good person, generally. <laughs> yeah, just in general. All right, well, Andy, I mean, do you want to take it or you want me to go first? I'll think? go first. I'll get this out of the way, Art. All because right, I don't know what the fuck I, you're going to say. I mean, I'm going to just, I mean, I got to rate it in this sense. I got to say... Was this, I got to just go, was this a UFO? What, well, no, 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 no. Was this a UFO? Was this an extraterrestrial spacecraft? that? Because it is a UFO. It is a UFO, it, regardless. It's, it's unidentified Even if it's an object. Earth, earthly craft or yeah. just astronomical stuff, it's a UFO because nobody's been able to figure it out. Right, we don't know what the fuck's So it still on. remains a UFO. Is this UFO an alien extraterrestrial spacecraft? <sighs> I'm biting my nails. Oh, oh God, there's nails everywhere. <laughs> yeah, I'm covered in nail clippings. Uh, I just got to go straight down the middle and say plausible. Whoa, he did it. I can't, I can't. He said it. I can't waver. I mean, I, you know. I, my God. My guts, my insides are telling me maybe go like plausible minus on this. <laughs> just because we, I, I don't know how I feel about it extraterrestrial crafts in our atmosphere in general. Yeah. This one, though, has got me feeling some kind of way, Art. I <laughs> am just not sure one way or the other. So I'm taking a straight down the road, the middle of the fairway approach, and saying, it's just plausible. I mean, do you want it to be an extraterrestrial? Yeah, I do. It would. I mean, it's kind of cool. It's cool. And, and if it's, you want it to be, an, you want it to be like the way we think they should be. Which and is, this is what it is. We don't want some boring bullshit yeah. extraterrestrial race to come here with their dopey looking craft. If this is some kind of Scientology freaking <laughs> DC ten bullshit, get out of here. I don't want it. <laughs> Give me some aliens with some good freaking spacecraft. I like this Tehran thing. Elrod Hubbard, fuck off. My God, Andy is fired up. Woo! Baby! <laughs> He's about to go march down to Tom Cruise's house and fucking challenge him to I'm a, coming for you, Cruise! <laughs> to a uh, to a fly-off. <laughs> Please don't hurt me. You're, You're the Iceman. He's Maverick. Oh, I think that was, the, yeah. I'm bringing ice to the party, Tom Cruise. <laughs> Watch out. <laughs> We're going to get in the squared circle and I'll take you to the mat. <laughs> Would you wrestle Tom Cruise? No, I wouldn't. You, you gotta, wouldn't? No. Oh, he's my like God. He's 50-something, Andy. He's 50, but think about it. He is not a tall man. He's got a low center of gravity, and you know that he's freaking built. He is very much I in shape. I saw, just recently, I saw one of those newer Mission Impossible movies. Yeah, Fallout. Yeah, if I, if I, I think I saw yeah, he was shirtless. Rogue State or whatever. Oh, yeah. Uh, the fourth but one. I saw parts of both, like the one before and then that one, I yeah. think. Whichever one was first. Um. Canonically love spy movies. Yeah, canonically, I do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's very much uh, 
uh, in the canon for me. Um, but he, I mean, he did a lot of his own stunts for that and stuff. He so. does do a lot of his own stunts. I mean, look, Art, we've said it on here before, and and I'm going to say it again. I made a huge mistake <laughs> with the Grey Wolf. I'm not making the same mistake with Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise, I don't want to fight you. You're going to beat me. I'm going to die. If you tried to get the fisticuffs with me, you'd break my nose. My nose goes to my brain. I die. I don't wow. need it. I need to stay alive. You don't even think you can last a couple seconds with Tom Cruise. Oh, I could maybe punch him in the dick or something, and that would <laughs> slow him down, but that's all I got. Uh, I mean, you'd have to punch pretty low. Yeah, he probably knows, like, martial arts and stuff. I mean... Yeah, you're right. Like he's, he's probably healthy. had this train. Yeah, he's healthy. I am not. I am on the verge. But I've got another. You're I've tough got to move. Three good years left in me. I think. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Without some serious changes. <laughs> Four tops. <laughs> Listeners, what do you think? Could you fight Tom Cruise? Say I'm cruising for a bruising. Uh, <laughs> hashtag I'm cruising for a bruising. Let us know. You think you could fight Tom Cruise? Look, I know I could fight him, but I don't think I could win. So, listeners, I think that's an important thing. Do you think you could win? I don't know. What do you think? You think I could win? You? I got reach and height on him. You got reach and height on him. Um, I think that he's going to be a better fighter than you, though. For sure. And that's where I think you'll I've only fail. been in one fight in my life, and I walked away. If you had even... <laughs> if you had even, I got punched in the face and left. <laughs> exactly. If you had even the tiniest bit of technique, which you don't have, no, you could probably win. But you don't have any technique. He's going to have good technique. He's yeah. going to be... If I can get him on the ground, I win. He's probably... I got better ground game. In better physical shape than you, but not by a significant margin. He's much <laughs> older, Andy. He is much older, but... And he's broken... A, he's been injured before. Yeah. I don't have any severe injuries. Emotional. <laughs> yeah. He's damaged goods. Um, I think if I can get Tom Cruise to the ground, I win. If I can get Tom Cruise on the ground, I can overpower him. Leg sweep? No, I'd have to I'd have to clinch and then somehow take down. Yeah, like do a takedown or like yeah, do a leg sweep. Oh, but if okay. I can get you a submission the hold, leg sweep and now you're on board with it. No, I, I just I'm not doing like a classic, like I'm fucking like gonna sweep him with my leg and knock him over like I think you should street fighter. I think you should use the moves of your people and pick him up like a dough ball and flip him <laughs> like a pizza pie and then just smack him down on the ground. But in a straight up brawl, I think he wins. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, you're right. He probably knows how to like kick and strike better. He probably could see my punches coming from a mile away because mm -hmm. I don't punch fast. He's bringing shit to a piss fight. You know what I mean? Like yeah. he's, but I you. think you gotta give me, if I got him on the ground, I'm just, I'm bigger than him and I have longer limbs than him. I'm not a huge person, but I'm taller than Tom Cruise. I bet he's strong. He's probably got old man strength, <laughs> but I think if I get him to the ground, he doesn't have. You know what, though? Uh, what else I'm realizing is he's trained for so many movies with, like, combat experience. Like, when he did Collateral, he trained. He became, like, an expert marksman to do a certain scene in that movie where he has to, like, shoot three people. Yeah. Like, in the movie, he has to pull out his... He has to, like, pull a pistol out of his, like, concealed carry and shoot a guy and then shoot another guy. And he's, like, he got so fucking good at it that, like, he was on a professional level. Yeah. So now I just remember that. I still think if I could get him to the ground, I win. But don't remember. Don't forget, he trained as a samurai too. Oh fuck yeah, that's right. He's the last samurai. Yeah. I don't know. I think it's looking bad for me. Yeah. I think that you were overly confident. You should have. I come still in like think me. if I get him on the ground, I win. Okay. I think you'd be shocked at how hard it is to fight from the ground if you're not 100 percent trained in jujitsu. Mm, true. Cause he's on the ground. Let's say he's on his face. I'm on his back, you know. And I just I'm just trying to like get him in a guillotine hold. If I get my legs around him, it's much easier for me to get my legs around him than it is for him to get his legs around me. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, we're acting like Tom Cruise is like four foot nine. He's <laughs> like five four or something, right? No, I'm pretty sure that he is diminutive. Uh, I think that he is uh, three feet tall. <laughs> he lives in a pocket. <laughs> That's why they call him Tom Thumb. Tom Cruise height. It's 5'7". Oh, five my seven. God. Oh, God. He's two inches taller than me. What? <laughs> so, okay, never mind. There's no way I'm beating Tom Cruise. He's nope. not that short at all. That sealed the deal for me. And Nicole Kidman, though, 5'11". Yeah, well. Anyway.
Okay, I could not beat Tom Cruise in a fight, definitely. But listeners, let us know if you think you could. Use the hashtag cruising for a bruising. Katie Holmes, 5'9". He likes him tall. He likes him tall him. and not saying anything against his religion. <laughs> <laughs> Keanu Reeves, 6'1". You can even call it that. You can't. It's not a real religion. No. Anyway, okay, I need to get to my verdict, Andy. We got off on a cruise You there. hear me, O. Ron Hubbard? I'll fight you anytime, anywhere, you <laughs> fucking old fuck. Well, he's dead. You'd be fighting a corpse. Yeah, and I could take a corpse. <laughs> you could probably fight L. Ron Hubbard, too. Well, he's crazy. Yeah, he's crazy. He's got that, like, that kind of craziness where he doesn't care about what happens to himself. Yeah, he's got all that He's got all that nautical stuff in his pockets. Who knows what he's going to pull out on you? <laughs> Pulls out a big old anchor and just yeah. smacks you in the face. <laughs> Throws out a bag full of lobsters. He's just got land on you. A, a, a treasure chest full of Spanish doubloons. <laughs> he's a, got concealed in his pants. Keeps an orca in a cage. <laughs> yeah, sharks with laser beams on their heads. Anyway, okay, my verdict. Andy, I'm shocked that I was floored that you said plausible, leaning on plausible minus, because I feel the exact same way. Wow. I am with you. We have to double go. whammy. Right down the middle with this, Andy. We have to. How it's can just you not? How it is. This is where the evidence leads us. Brian Dunning himself, the award-winning Brian Dunning himself, even says, Mr. Awards, Brian Dunning. <laughs> Mr. Lights. Name on the marquee. Brian Dunning himself says that he doesn't know, but then he clarifies it by saying that there's nothing interesting enough for me. It's like, whatever. It's, right, it's, right, It's interesting. Right. What are you talking about? It's fucking, it's super interesting. Yeah. Even by saying, I don't know, we have to give it the plausible award. If you're saying verdict, I, I, I think if you say, I don't know, you can't say, then I definitively know. I If I don't know what it is, then I definitively know what it is not. You can't go case closed or case confirmed. Yeah. You have to go plausible if you say, I don't know. I agree. And I'm saying, I don't know. 100% agree. I kind of want to believe that it was one. Yeah. If there was, like, I'm like, I'm with you. Yeah. I don't want the fucking Xenu... 737 fucking aircraft coming in here. Blah. Yeah. That's getting funked. Yeah. You you bring that crap in here, extraterrestrials, we'll funk you right out of Earth. <laughs> um, Bring us something we can sink our teeth into, you know? So let's get weird. Let's get like, this is a weird gas-based organism that we don't understand. We want you to have to go out of your way to be visible to us. <laughs> We want you to have to like wear a weird suit just so that we can see you because our senses don't align with your physical properties. Yeah, and you can't breathe our atmosphere. Yeah, we want you to wear a big weird suit just like we have to do. <laughs> it makes us feel close. <laughs> Extraterrestrials? We wear big weird suits like that in that Kanye West video. That's what Andy and I wear every single day. Big weird suits. I have a hoodie that's 85 sizes too big. <laughs> and cost $3,000. <laughs> It says Jesus on it. <laughs> I'm poor now. <laughs> I don't have a home anymore. But God damn, do you look cool. I look freaking weird and cool. <laughs> you look like an alien. Listeners, what do you think? Did we get it right? Did we get it wrong? Let us know. Use the hashtag. I Tehran. I Tehran so far away. <laughs> From this topic because I don't believe it. <laughs> What? Uh, <laughs> what? What? Nah, use the hashtag uh, Tehran UFO of 1976. Oh, okay. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> we can't come up with a better one. Uh, and let us know. Uh, tweet at us at Mr. Bunker Pod on Instagram and Twitter. <laughs> and um, email us, Mr. Bunker Pod yeah. at gmail.com. We've gotten some great some delicious messages emails. from fans, yeah. and it seriously is the coolest thing in the world. It warms our hearts. It makes Mr. Bunker feel pretty good about himself, too. Yeah, he's much nicer to us. Yeah, yeah. The beatings have subsided. <laughs> uh, and let us know what you think about this episode. Andy. Miart. 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 I think that's it for us today. I for think this, that's for it. this one. Um, we got it. Any last words? Uh, I just want to say, hey, uh, great story uh, from Tehran. Um, you know, it's pretty cool to see the transparency uh, with this, that there was a lot of effort to try to figure out what happened. Um, and that's pretty cool. Wow. 
That's nice. Well, Andy, it's good to have you back in the bunker. I'm sure the listeners are pleased as well to hear that you're back and everything's okay. And Listeners, um, I missed you. Okay. Well, for the t- <laughs> It's been so long since I kissed you. Andy, uh, we talked about this. Please don't kiss the listeners in the <laughs> mouth anymore. Sorry, listeners. <laughs> We're sorry for everything. <laughs> Truly. Like everything. <laughs> everything we've ever done. Everything we we've put so you through. So apologize to you, listeners. <laughs> we were wrong, but we can't stop. We have a problem. <laughs> We're sick. We know what we're doing and we can't stop it. Listeners, for the titular Mr. Bunker and for my copacetic. Oh, that's me. <laughs> Co host, Andy Hart. I'm Arthur Stone saying that was the whole enchilada. Ooh. <laughs>